ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good evening, good evening. And welcome to the Queens District Attorney's Office Crime Prevention Webinar. My name is Marlon Palacios Jr., Senior Community Coordinator at the Queens County District Attorney's Office. On behalf of the Community Partnerships Division, I want to bring you guys greetings from Melinda Katz, our District Attorney. The purpose of tonight's program is to educate the community on crime prevention tips. How do we do that, you ask? By informing you of the tactics, tendencies of the tactics and tendencies of these individuals that these individuals exercise when trying to impose upon you, while simultaneously providing you with resources and next steps on how you can protect you and your loved ones from falling victim to this lawless activity. Tonight, you will view presentations from three professionals on the duties that their respective bureaus do within this office. The first presentation will be from our Elder Abuse Project, and I'm gonna explain each individual um, bureau and brief synopsis. I wanna step on any of the uh, presenters' toes, but the first presentation will be from our Elder Abuse Project, where we present social, where we have social work services that we present to the elderly and victims of financial abuse, physical abuse, and other crimes, and serves as a liaison between the seniors and the criminal justice system and train seniors and and seniors and trained seniors provide certain provide services. My apologies about our elder elder abuse and how to prevent it. Next, we will have the Housing and Workers Protection Bureau, which is established by the Queens DA Melinda Katz during her first year in office. The Housing and Worker Protection Bureau investigates and prosecutes crimes related to deed fraud, mortgage fraud, and construction fraud, as well as wage theft and workplace safety. Finally, you will hear from the Frauds Bureau. During her first year in the office, Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz created the Frauds Bureau to investigate and prosecute crimes related to embezzlement, investment scams, insurance fraud, online scams, confidence schemes, trademark counterfeiting, environmental crimes, tax fraud, unemployment fraud, workers' protection compensation, Section 8 fraud, SNAP benefits fraud, and financial crimes targeting the elderly. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, Ms. Lori Woods. Since 2004, Lori has been the director of the Queens District Attorney's Office Elder Abuse Project. She wore various other professional hats before, before coming to her present job. She taught English as a second language for a decade and then entered the practice of law. Lori did Article 81 guardianships for HRA and then directed a legal services program for persons living with HIV and AIDS. In 1999, she returned to school for a social work degree and came to the district attorney's office in 2004 as the director of the Elder Abuse Project. The Elder Abuse Project is a social work program funded by the New York State, offices, State Office of Victim Services. Lori and her staff provide social work services to the elderly victims of financial abuse, physical abuse, and other crimes, and serve as a liaison between seniors and criminal justice system and train seniors to provide and service providers about elder abuse and how to prevent it. Lori holds a master's degree in teaching English as a second language and a law degree, and, and a law degree, a master's in social work from, health, uh, from Hunter College. She is a licensed, pract licensed to practice both law and social work in the state of New York. Please welcome Lori Woods, Director of the Elder Abuse Project. Good evening, everybody out there. It's super weird for me to be talking into a computer screen. I'm used to seeing actual people and it feels really bizarre to just be talking. Anyway, what was not formally on my resume is that I am also a senior. I'm a youngish senior, but I'm a senior nonetheless. And I, as you know, I've been working at the DA's office for 20 years. Um, one second, I'm looking at the time. I don't want to go over my slot. And as such, I know about the scams, the schemes, and everything, and I am super vigilant, but yet, I have been the victim of financial fraud twice in that 20 years that I've been in the office. So tonight, my piece of this rock is going to be first to talk, to define some terms. 
to talk about what financial exploitation and elder fraud are. Second, to talk about some steps that we all can take to lower our risk of becoming victimized. And then third, what to do if we or a loved one becomes a victim. So first a word, when I say elder, so stuff is elder abuse, usually depending on the funding that is funding the service and what the age requirements are. For the Queens District Attorney's Office Elder Abuse Project, we work with anybody 60 or older, which is pretty darn young, in my opinion. So when I say financial abuse, this can be a whole bunch of things. So the most obvious thing that all of you know about is when somebody takes or misuses a senior's money or property or identity without that person's informed consent. So informed consent means that the senior has to be cognitively competent to understand what the senior is being asked to consent to. If somebody has some memory loss, as many of us do, and let's say that you need to be able to hold seven things in your head at once to make an informed decision, and you can hold three things in your head, then if you say yes, it's not a meaningful yes, because you don't have informed consent. The second would be when someone refuses to use a senior's resources to provide needed goods or services. When somebody says, my mother is 90, she doesn't need a new sofa. And I'm like, well, A, it's her money. B, she's alive and she needs to sit in her own living room. So C, yeah, you should get her the new sofa. There's no reason not to do that. Another place I see this kind of financial exploitation is where a senior has Medicare, but not Medicaid, and they are coming out of a hospitalization, and the hospital social worker says, your mother is going to need a special bed, and she's going to need a shower chair. She's going to need an aid in a couple of days a week. And then the adult child doesn't want to use mom's money to pay for those things. That is financial abuse. And then the last kind of financial abuse is using undue influence on a senior where the exploiter says things like, you better give me the money or this is the last time you're going to see the grandchildren or you better give me that money or I'm going to put you in a home. So that is financial abuse. And of course, finance. And so going back to the first thing I said, taking or misusing a senior's money. So part of taking is getting it by trick. And Ayelet, my colleague who's going to be presenting, she's going to be talking to you about the different scams and schemes and way that, ways that these awful people will try to trick you out of your money. So people who realize they've become the victim of a crime. The first thing they think of is, oh my, how could I have been so stupid? How did I miss this? How did I fall into this? I feel so ashamed. So I'm here to tell you this. All of us who work are pretty good at what we do for a living. And this is what these creeps do for a living. They scam people. This is the way they make their money. And they are really good at it. They're really convincing. There is no shame involved here. If you become a victim, I want you, please, to contact the Elder Abuse Project. And when I am done with this presentation, I'm going to put my name, my phone number, and my email address into the chat. 
so that you can all see it and you can all copy it down. So that is what financial exploitation is. Let's talk about some ways we can lower our own risk of becoming victims. So the two ways that I was the victim of financial exploitation were, number one, somebody made a $350 PayPal charge using my identity. And I don't even have PayPal. So, and I discovered that because of one technique that we can all do, which is if you use a credit card and you use the internet, you should go on the website for your credit card at least a couple of times during every billing month. And you wanna look and you wanna see what charges are there because I did that and I saw this PayPal charge and I did the same drill that I would encourage any of you to do if God forbid you become a victim. I went to the police, I made a police report, I notified the credit reporting agencies. I took all the steps that I work with my own clients about doing for themselves. So prevention technique number one is, like I said, to check your credit card statement online during the billing cycle. And together with that, please, when you get your bill, open it quickly. Don't let it sit. Open it up and look it over really carefully and look at every charge. And if you see something that to you looks funky, then get in touch with your credit card company. The other thing we can do, most of us can do is with our banks and also with our credit cards, we can set a ceiling where if, if it's a bank, if somebody wants to make a withdrawal that's over the amount of that ceiling, you will get a notification and you will have to approve that withdrawal before it will go through. And with a credit card, you can set a ceiling where anything above that ceiling, they will send you a text or an email letting you know about that transaction. And that was the second thing that happened to me. It was almost a year ago, I am a very busy person, and sometimes I grab time in the evening to take a run to do grocery and produce shopping. And it was 11.45 at night, and I had just come back from shopping, and I'm about to turn off my cell phone for the night, and I'm like, I'm going to check my email. And it's a good thing I did because there was a notification from my credit card company telling me that somebody had just purchased an airline ticket for $1,100. And I promptly called the fraud department at my credit card at a quarter to midnight, and they started a fraud complaint, which of course I won because I had just been grocery shopping here in New York City when somebody in Texas was using my identity to buy an airplane ticket to California. So you need to make these notifications of fraud quickly. So open your credit card statements, set ceilings with your bank, set ceilings with your credit card company. And another thing you should do is open bank statements without delay. Banks are notorious for trying to dodge having to credit people back money when the people have been scammed. So you must act on this really almost immediately. I had a client a few years ago who was, you know, more or less my age. She was a working senior and she and her husband had the misfortune of his being diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. And this poor woman spent two or three months taking her husband to his treatments and back and to his appointments and back. She took a leave from work. 
Finally, the treatment kicked in, he was doing better, and she started going through the mail. And she's opening bank statements. She sees that somebody withdrew $15,000, $15,000 from her bank account. And she went running to the bank the next day. And they looked at her and they said, that was four months ago. Okay, you had 90 days to get to this bank and make this complaint and you didn't do it. So we're sorry, but it's done. We're not going to credit this back. So time is very much of the essence. Another thing that you can do is you can think ahead and make a plan. So I think that later in this program, somebody will tell you about the grandparent scam, but I'm just going to tell it quickly to make the point that I want to make from that. That's where the phone rings and you get this crackly phone call and you hear somebody go, Grandma, is I'm so glad you answered the phone. So safety checkpoint one, don't say the name of your grandchild because if you really have a grandson and his name is Jimmy and you say, oh, Jimmy, is that you? They've got you. They've got you. And then they'll give you some nonsense story. Oh, I was arrested. I'm being held in Canada. I need you to send by Western Union, you know, $1,500 and blah, 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 blah. So if you're ever in that situation, think of some kind of security question and not something easy, not what's your address, because people can get that online. I want you to think creatively. I want you to think creatively. Jimmy, can you tell me what the picture looks like that's over my sofa? Jimmy, when did you see me last and what did I cook for dinner? Jimmy, what kind of pet did you have when you were a child and what was the name of that pet? You want to think about questions that only the real Jimmy will be able to answer. So that's one thing. Two is, okay, they can't scam you if they can't get you. So when the phone rings, don't do anything before you look at your caller ID. Look at your phone. Do you know this number? No. Well, then don't answer it. It'll go into voicemail. And if there is really legitimacy, then the person will leave you a voice message. And then you will be able to call them back. But if they can't talk to you, they can't scam you. Go talk to a lawyer and make a plan for who is going to step up to the plate and manage your finances and pay your bills and take care of your business if God forbid you become unable to do that for yourself. Because if you don't make a plan and you have a crisis, people who are in crisis don't usually make the clearest and best decisions. Um, one second, shred your documents. Everybody in this audience should have a shredder. And I don't mean the one that makes strips. You want the one that makes confetti. And you want to mix up that stuff so that scammers can't get to your bank records and your credit card statements and so on and so forth and use that to perpetrate identity theft. So shred everything. Also, Every one of us is entitled every 12 months to a free credit report from each of the three major credit reporting companies. That would be Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. So instead of getting three all at once, get from one company, wait four months, get from the next, 
and then wait four more months and get from the third one, and then it'll cycle around. So by, okay. Marlon Palacios, I think I have five minutes. Can you confirm that? Okay. Groovy. All right. So you're going to shred your documents. You're not going to let mail accumulate. You're going to read your statements and blah, blah, blah. So super quickly, I'm going to tell you what to do if despite all of your best precautions, you become a victim. So the first thing you do if you're 60 or older is you call me. And as soon as I pass the baton over to Bill, I'm going to put my info in the chat for you. So we are New York State licensed social workers, and sometimes we have social work students working with us. To make the process as easy as we can for you, we will come to you. We can come to your home. If you are a client of a senior center and that's the place you feel comfortable, we'll go there and we'll meet with you there. And we'll sit with you, we'll hear you. We'll figure out what the best action plan is. Now, I get cases, I get people who haven't even made a police report yet. And we will talk about how to make that report I will give you some phrases to use like larceny so that when you go to make the police report, they will hear you accurately and hopefully take the report. Um, and we, so I know, right? Cause I've been a crime victim. You know, we feel horrible when we've become a victim. We perseverate, we think about it. We don't sleep well, we don't eat well. So we're here to listen to you. We're here to do some figurative handholding for you. And we are also here to help you with an application to the New York State Office of Victim Services. This is a wonderful fund. It's federal victim services money channeled to an agency in Albany and then channeled down to programs like ours. If you are the victim of physical abuse and you have medical bills related to your injuries, once you've submitted those bills to your own health insurance, if you have co-payments or exclusions, OVS, Office of Victim Services, OVS will pay all of the rest with no ceiling. Likewise, if you are the victim of what they, of some sort of theft of what they consider essential personal property, like your house was broken into and the window was broken or the door was broken, or they couldn't find anything to steal and they were angry and they slit your sofa with a knife, or you were mugged and your purse was stolen and your wallet was taken, or you were scammed out of money. Let's say these awful people told you, told you to buy Western Union, uh, no, gift cards to send to the scammers on, let's say, five different occasions, we can do five different applications. For cash that's stolen, cash caps at $100 a transaction. But if you were scammed, if this thing, you bought gift cards, let's say, on 10 occasions, that's 10 times 100, which is a not insignificant amount of money that we can get back for you. So please don't take this the wrong way, but I hope I never see you because I don't want you to become a victim and I work with victims. So stay safe, folks, and copy my information down from the chat and I will pass the microphone to actually back to Marlon, who will introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Lori. I appreciate you and all of the information that you gave to the community. Next, and that was just amazing. Let me start with that, end with that. Next, we have our representative from the Hauser and Worker Protection Bureau, William Jurgensen. I'm going to read his information so you can have a little bit of background of what and how Mr. Jurgensen has been taking care of the Hauser and Worker Protection Bureau and the community in its entirety 
uh, over the last few years. Bill Jurgensen is the chief of the Housing and Worker Protection Bureau. The Bureau investigates crime involving housing and home ownership scams and worker exploitation issue, issues such as wage theft and workplace safety. Bill's career as a prosecutor spanned three decades in various offices throughout the New York City metropolitan area. Prior to joining the Queens District Attorney's Office, Bill worked as an assistant district attorney in Staten Island's District Attorney's Office and the Office of Special Narcotics Prosecutor in Manhattan, where he handled numerous trials involving narcotics and homicide cases. Bill then worked in the New York State Attorney General's Office, where he investigated and prosecuted complex auto insurance fraud conspiracies. From 2007 through 2014, Bill worked as an assistant district attorney conducting white collar prosecutions in Nassau County District in the Nassau County District Attorney's Office, where he focused on the investigation and prosecution of financial crimes and public corruption. Bill moved on as an moved on to work as an associate commissioner at the New York City Department of Investigations, where he oversaw investigations, training, and recruiting efforts for the department. Most recently, he was in private practice performing consulting and, con and training in the, areas, in the areas of criminal and administrative law. Please welcome Bill Jurgensen, Bureau Chief of the Housing and Worker Protection Bureau. Good evening. Thanks, Marlon. Boy, I get tired just hearing about all of that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here, and I, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to everyone um, about how you can protect yourselves. Um, as Marlon was saying, our bureau focuses on a number of uh, crimes that generally traditionally haven't received a lot of attention. Um, the principal one of which I'm going to talk about here is deed theft. Uh, you know, over my career, having done so many different things over uh, over the years throughout the New York metropolitan area, uh, one thing I had not come in contact was deed theft and fraud. And I didn't realize until I came here to Queens just how prevalent that crime has become. And I think part of it is because uh, it's not an easy crime to learn how to commit. Uh, so it hasn't really been done all that much in the past. We're seeing a greater amount of it all the time um, because once people learn how to commit deed theft and fraud, they realize just how lucrative it can be. Uh, because if you think about it, how do you steal a home? You steal a home. You don't steal a home by jacking it up and putting on a flatbed and driving it down the road. You steal a home by stealing title to that home. And in fact, as a, by way of an illustration, I think it was about 10 years ago, a couple of newspaper reporters here in New York City actually managed to steal the Empire State Building. Uh, so clearly they didn't move that. And they did so by filing false documents with the city, making it look like they owned the property themselves, when of course they didn't. So what I'm going to do to try and make this a little, this concept a little easier to understand, and Marlon, I uh, hope you and Renee can help me out here. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen because I have this fancy PowerPoint that I'm going to put up. So let's see if this works. Uh, where is my PowerPoint? Hmm. Okay. Let's see. I thought I had it here somewhere. Uh, let me see. Nope, I'm not. Ah, here we go. Okay. So. Let me do the slideshow, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I get this done. Um, Press the first one, play from the beginning. Though. Yes, this is the first slide, and let me see if I... In the left-hand corner, it says play from beginning. Ah, right, here we go. Thank you. There we go. Okay, can, can you... Marlon, am I... Uh, is this coming up okay? Perfect. Okay. So we're going to talk about deed fraud. We're going to talk about how we can protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community from this crime that is becoming ever more popular. And again, to give you an idea, the scope of deed fraud and the reason why people are doing it is, if you think of it this way, um, if someone goes out and somebody comes out and knocks me on the head and takes my wallet, what are they going to find? They're going to find a couple of credit cards. They're going to disappear. They're going to be canceled in a, a short while. And then maybe you're going to find $30 or $40 cash. Well, the other thing that they're going to find out pretty quickly is that there's going to be a whole precinct full of police officers and detectives chasing after them. And when they get this person who knocked me on the head, took my wallet, 
he's going to go to jail and he's going to go to jail for a long time. Now, with white collar crime, such as embezzlement, deed fraud, insurance fraud, these are what we call nonviolent crimes. And so the, the result of these crimes is often, uh, you know, a person's not going to get uh, as much jail time. And especially in the case of deed fraud, the results are a lot more lucrative. I mean, think about it. If you steal the title to someone's house and make it look like you own their house, how much is a house in Queens worth? I mean, to give you an idea of just how lucrative this is, we prosecuted a case a few years ago where a person pretended to be the owner of the house. They sold the, they sold the house. They then took a check. They went to a check cashing place and they walked out with a duffel bag full of money, about a quarter of a million dollars. And that's clearly on the low side. So what we want to do is we've realized that because this crime is becoming more prevalent, one of the best things that we can do is to try and help you guys show how, uh, learn how you can prevent being a victim. Because there are simple steps that you can take to avoid becoming a victim of deed fraud. So I'm going to talk, uh, first of all, we'll talk a little more about how this happens and how you can prevent yourself, from, how you can find out if you are a victim and more importantly, prevent yourself from becoming a victim. Because I'm going to steal this from you, Lori. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to talk to you guys, but I just hope I never meet any of you because if I meet you, it means that you've been the victim of deed fraud. So let's get started. Let's talk about these scams. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating about this whole process is the fact that scammers are constantly trying new ways to steal people's money. Um, and the creativity involved in some of these scams really boggles my mind. I, quite frankly, am just not that imaginative. I would never think of these things. Um, but we're going to talk about some of those. So what we're going to do as we do this is we're going to show you how you can prevent from prevent yourself from being a victim. So how does this happen? Well, there's a couple of different ways that deed fraud happens. And one of those ways is by uh, using stolen ID. Uh, using stolen identif identities or falsified documents, uh, the fraudster can refinance the mortgage or, um, you know, basically put the house in that person's name. And once the person, once the fraudster gets the house in their name, they are off to the races, right? I mean, if I own a house, I can uh, get a refinance. I can get a second mortgage. I can get a home equity line of credit. I can uh, do a whole boatload of things. And in the meantime, you may still be stuck with the mortgage. So now you don't own your home, but you still own the bills. Another way that this can happen is they can take advantage of seniors or uh, people who are in crisis with an offer of quote unquote refinancing. Uh, the person signs documents, not necessarily knowing what they are, and they find out too late that maybe they've transferred the title or uh, they've, uh, you know, put the house in someone else's name. So, uh, you know, you want to be really careful about that. We're going to talk about how you can prevent yourself from being a victim in that regard. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is that the fraudsters target houses that are neglected. And I have to tell you, I have been working on a case just recently. I can't go into any specifics, but I can tell you that it's been in the media. Uh, it, it was in the media a while back. Um, and it involved a house that was neglected. Uh, and, and, you know, you see a house where the lawn isn't mowed or the paint is peeling. That is like blood in the water to a fraudster because they're going to say, hey, that house is empty. Nobody's taking care of it. Nobody's watching what's going on. Okay. Um, this often happens with unoccupied vacation homes or uh, rental properties. Um, and it happens maybe with that piece of property that you inherited, you know, your great aunt Phyllis, right? She passed away. Um, and the family is still trying to figure out what to do with the house. And in the meantime, you know, the weeds are growing up through the cracks in the pavement, the paint is peeling, the roof needs work. Um, and every, nobody can agree on what to do. And next thing you know, six months have gone by and now the fraudsters see what's going on and they see a target. And for that matter, so can the squatters. 
So they can use a forged deed to sell the home and a profit without a profit from that sale without you even knowing about it until it comes time to sell the property. And then you find out, wait a minute, what is somebody doing in front of my house, gutting the property and throwing everything into a dumpster? So how can you tell if you're a victim? Well, one of the things that you should keep in mind is there's going to be a number of warning signs. And before I go any further, I always ask people, how many people here like to receive their tax bill in the mail? And almost everybody that I speak to says, uh, says, I don't like to receive my bill. But I have to tell you, I have come to really appreciate receiving my tax bill in the mail. And I'm going to tell you a little story. When my father, my father came home from World War II, he turned 20 in a foxhole in Anzio fighting the Germans. And when he came home, he met my mom and they moved into a house. Uh, they, they, bought a, they moved into an apartment in Staten Island. And after saving their, uh, saving their money for 12 years, they bought a little piece of property on a dead end street in the middle of the woods in Staten Island. And then what they did was they, had a, they paid for a hole in the ground. And then they paid for a foundation and then they paid to build the house. And over maybe 10 years, they finally were able to build this house with the money they had saved over the previous 10 years. And then when I came along, they built a home and they stayed in that home for 50 years. And after my parents passed away, they left that home to me. Now, I, I feel that I am in charge of that legacy because this is something that my parents built up over the decades, over a lifetime. Now, I still pay all the bills. And one of the bills that I get is the tax bill. And as I was saying before, I actually like getting that tax bill. Why do I like getting that tax bill? Because it means that the city still thinks that that property is in my name. If that property was somehow taken from me, I would no longer receive the tax bill. And so that's the first one of the first warning signs you want to look for. You're not getting that bill that you should have received. Okay, you're not getting the water bill or the notices from the bank or the mortgage company. If the bills suddenly stop, you should start worrying. Okay, what does that mean? That means that an identity theft, uh, the identity thief may have gone to the taxing authority and changed the address in which the bills will be sent in order to hide the crime. A couple of other things you want to look out for, especially if you're talking about a vacation home or if you're like a lot of people I know, you're a snowbird, you go down to Florida, or maybe, you know, in case of the pandemic, you were sheltering in place out of town. Uh, you want to start looking for, a, you know, higher than usual utility bills, right? I mean, if the property is vacated in the wintertime and you set the thermostat at 55 degrees to keep the pipes from freezing and you're used to getting a heating bill that's very low, and then suddenly that heating bill spikes, well, what does that tell you? That tells you somebody turned up the heat, okay? Um, you know, or worse yet, you come home and the house has got people living in, all right? Um, so, you know, because somebody realized that the house is unoccupied. Maybe people weren't taking in the mail. Maybe they hadn't trimmed the hedges. They hadn't mowed the lawn. Uh, and they said, hey, there's nobody here. I'm moving in. So uh, the other thing is, let's say you rent out the house. I rent out my mother's house to a very old and dear friend of mine who's a retired firefighter. And if I stop receiving Rob's rent payments, I'm going to know about it. So, oh, and, and what is that a symptom of? That basically means that somebody came along and said, hey, the house has been sold to the tenant, and now you want to send me your, tent, your rent bills, Okay. So they're defrauding you out of your house and they're defrauding the tenants out of uh, you know, their money. So again, if you're expecting to see payments regarding that house, that's something else you wanna keep in mind. Um, the other thing you wanna keep out for is maybe you start receiving payment books or other information from a lender from whom you've never done business, okay? Uh, you know, if you say, well, wait a minute, you know, I paid off, uh, mom and dad paid off the house or Aunt Tootie paid off the house. And now all I do is I pay the tax bill and I pay the water bill. And then suddenly you get a coupon book or you get an online statement from Wells Fargo talking about a $500,000 mortgage. Well, that should tip you up, right? So this is something else you want to keep in mind. 
I can certainly tell you that if I suddenly got a a, a mortgage bill for five hundred thousand dollars, I would be running out to the police right away. So, um, the other thing is, and this is obviously the nightmare scenario, you may find yourself in default on a loan or notify the foreclosure proceedings, and you don't even have a mortgage. And that has happened more often than you think. Uh, people have come to us and they say, you know, I paid off my house 15 years ago, and now all of a sudden uh, I get a nasty letter in the mail saying I'm in foreclosure. What does that mean? That means that somebody took title to your house, they took out a mortgage on your house, they then cashed out that mortgage, uh, and now you're left with the bill. Okay, so another warning sign. So the big question is, how do I prevent becoming a victim? Well, uh, one of the first things that you should do is check the status of your title, confirm the status of the deed, okay? Um, and the way you do this is uh, you can go onto the city website for the Department of Finance. And Marlon, I understand that we have a flyer that we're going to be sending out to everyone, uh, showing them how to do this. Um, just so you know, the state, the city has uh, an agency called the City Register. The City Register uh, basically tracks everybody's everybody's home ownership. All right. So if I go into the City Register and I punch in the address of my mother's house, I'm going to find that listed with the New York City Department of Finance, and it's going to say that I'm the owner of the property. So what you want to do is you want to check the status of your deed by going to the New York City Department of finance and looking for your property okay the other thing that you want to do is you want to uh, and the way you're going to do that is you're going to go into something called actus which we're going to talk about in a minute the other thing that you're going to want to do is sign up for the recorded document notification program when you go to the city department of finance website you're going to have an opportunity to sign up for this program and what that does is, if anyone notifies, files a document, such as a bogus deed, regarding your property, you're going to be notified. And I can tell you that this is a great program because we have actually ca caught people trying to steal a home through this program. And again, I'm going to tell you a little story about a guy who had a property here in Queens. And he knew that someone was trying to scam his house because they had been squatting there, they'd been breaking in, they'd been claiming they owned it, they'd been chasing off other tenants. And so he signed up for the recorded document notification program. And what do you think about it? He gets the notification, he calls us up, we reach out to the city register and we request the video surveillance cameras from the date and time, the date, time and place from when this document was filed with the city register. And what do we get? We got crystal clear, high definition video of our subject coming in and filing these bogus deeds. Well, we were able to use that evidence and a lot of other evidence to go out and indict this person. So this program is a really powerful tool for protecting yourself from being a victim. Now, the other thing that you're going to want to look at is you're going to want to look at ACRIS. And again, our flyer is going to tell you how to do all this. So don't worry about taking notes right now because we're going to be sending out this flyer to you. You're also going to get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. So again, don't feel like you got to take this stuff down and be scrambling to write notes. Um, ACRIS is the city system by which they keep track of all documents pertaining to every piece of property in four of the five boroughs. Staten Island has its own record keeping system. Is, you know, that's Staten Island, right? I can say that. I'm from Staten Island. Um, but that means that any deed that's filed on your property, any mortgage that's filed on your property, any power of attorney or lien that's filed on your property is going to be recorded in the ACRA system. And you can look at them free of charge anytime. And you can see the history of the ownership of your property. We use it as a powerful investigative tool, but it's a great uh, tool for homeowners. So another thing that you want to see, you want to do, and this is real simple, is just maintain your home, okay? Uh, I know it sounds simple uh, and it sounds obvious, but it's really true. 
fraudsters target homes that appear to be neglected. A neglected home is like a baby gazelle with a broken leg on the Serengeti. It ain't long for this world. If your property is unoccupied, you want to be checking it regularly to make sure that nobody else is occupying it illegally. All right. You want to ask someone if you're not in town, like I said, maybe you're down with family down south or uh, you're on a long term, uh, maybe you're uh, you know, uh, on a, a long term vacation or uh, at a summer home or something like that. You want to ask someone you trust to look after your house. When my parents went away uh, for a year uh, after they retired, they had they asked me to move back home and keep an eye on their house. Um, so I was able to pay the bills, make sure that the lawn was mowed, make sure that the, the house was kept clean. You want to make it clear that somebody is watching the store, right? So things like unmowed lawns, untrimmed hedges, peeling paint, uh, roof, tie, roof uh, that's, that's neglected, um, hedges that are overgrowing. These things are like blood in the water to a shark. Uh, for fraudsters. They're going to see that this house is not being taken care of. It's not being uh, maintained. Nobody's watching it. And those are the first locations that people go in. Okay. Other ways you can keep your home safe. Okay. Uh, stay away from anybody who's really aggressively trying to lend you money. Okay. Um, an agent or an appraiser, right? Don't let anybody stampede you into making a decision you're not comfortable or ready to make, okay? Be skeptical of uh, any of these online ads or solicitations promising a mortgage modification or to save your home from foreclosure. Again, you know, these guys are targeting people who are in distress. They are looking for weakness. You know, again, it's like the fish in the water that's that's bleeding, right? The shark is going to go for the the injured fish. They're looking if you are if you are somebody whose house is maybe you had a problem because you had a big medical bill and you're having a hard time making your your mortgage payment, or maybe you lost your job and it's getting tough to pay those bills. You know, again, if somebody finds out and they come to you and they offer you a deal that's too good to be true, guess what? It is okay. So be very careful when somebody comes to you. If you have a problem, um, if, for example, you get a, a foreclosure notification, it's going to include addresses and contact information for the bank so that you can contact the bank directly to talk about a loan modification or coming to a better, uh, you know, an agreement that will hopefully keep you in your home. You know, as crazy as it sounds, banks don't want to foreclose on homes because if they do, now they're stuck with a piece of property that they, they have to take care of. Um, don't give out any personal information to a solicitor, uh, especially your bank number, your social security number, or anything else that's personal. Um, you know, Lori spoke about this. ILET's going to go into greater detail about this, but it's one of those messages that just needs to be hammered home again and again and again. I'm never going to ask you for your personal information. Um, you know, you want to be really careful about who you send that to. And if somebody comes to you unbidden, unrequested, you know, that didn't that you didn't ask for help from, don't give them your your information. Don't give them your passwords, your account numbers, your anything. That's something between you and your bank. And remember, your bank's already going to have your social security number. All right, they're already going to have your bank account number. They're not going to need to ask that from you. And they're certainly not going to ask you for your passports. Um, what else can you do? Never sign a document you don't understand or a blank form, okay? Um, I'm going to tell you, when I purchased my house, I've been a lawyer for 32 years. Oh, my God, 33 years now, right? And when I went to purchase my house, I looked at some of these documents, and I didn't understand what they were. So I said to myself, I am not going to do this without, you know, competent assistance. So I reached out to somebody that I knew who I trusted, an attorney that I knew who specialized in this sort of work. And I had him act as my representative when it came to dealing with this so that I actually had competent advice. The other thing is, don't ever get rushed into signing anything. ILET's going to talk about that more. 
But this is another thing that fraudsters try to do. They want you to make a quick decision. They want to put pressure on you. They want to get you to sign now. You know what you're going to tell them? You're going to say no. Just like Nancy Reagan said, just say no. Okay? I'm not. If I don't understand something, I'm not signing it. And I'll tell you something else. If it's blank, I'm definitely not signing it. All right? Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to say, mm, you know what? This sounds great. I'm going to go talk to you know, my son, my nephew, my niece, my attorney, my friend that I trust really well, and get a second opinion on this, and I'll get back to you. And guess what's going to happen? If they're legitimate, they'll be they'll say, hey, fine, not a problem. If they're not legitimate, they're going to try and push you into making that decision. And that's another tip on it, right? If they're trying to pressure you, you know there's something wrong. Okay. Right? If this is a real foreclosure proceeding, you're going to have a lot of time to deal with this. Trust me on that one. Never pay, uh, you never want to pay an upfront fee for any kind of mortgage related service. All right. It's a violation in New York law to charge upfront fees for such services, and any violation should be retorted to the Attorney General's office. You can see I have the number here. Uh, again, don't worry about writing it down. You're going to get a copy of this PowerPoint at the end of this presentation. So, how else can we keep our homes safe? Well, as Lori was saying to you before, monitor your credit reports. And Lori, I have to apologize. I don't do this enough. I really should. You want to sign up and get your credit reporting from each of these guys. And I really like Lori's idea of doing this once every four months. So this way, you're constantly checking your credit report. Okay. Um, the other thing you might want to think about is buying an owner's uh, title insurance policy. Okay, something that's going to pay out, it can provide significant protection uh, and cost, cover the cost of collecting the property. Because one of the things that happens is that when your deed is stolen, you may have to go to court to get that deed put back in your name. Now, we here at the Housing and Work Protection Bureau, if we get the case and we get a conviction, and the conviction is for a certain type of crime, we can sometimes get the title back to you and avoid a lot of a lot of headaches from your part. And so we're trying to do that as much as possible. But we can't be everywhere and we may not be able to get a prosecution. We may not get to you or we may not be able to prosecute the case successfully. So what you want to do is get that title insurance so that this way, God forbid, you do need to hire an attorney that can help you pay for the attorney, right? Um, <clears throat> The other thing is just make sure that, you know, you have uh, that your the mailing addresses and all your contact information is up to date with the City of New York Department of Finance. You can do that by just going on their website and making sure that all your information is correct. Now, what do you do if you're the victim of a deed? Well, the first thing you got to do is call up your mortgage company and say, help, I'm the victim of a deed for all right. You want to reach out to all your creditors and tell them what's going on. Um, and you want to pull your credit reports and you want to file a report. Uh, you can report identity theft to the Federal Trade Commission. And you want to file a report with the police department and contact us right away. Okay. If you suspect any kind of deed fraud, please report it immediately. Now, if you have an elderly relative or neighbor who lives alone, don't be afraid to discuss these issues with them. You know, again, as we get older, we pride ourselves on our independence. Um, I know 60 is not that all that old, um, but I'm getting up there myself. And I, you know, I take pride in the fact that I can take care of myself. And I say to myself, I don't need any help. I can deal with this on my own. Um, I don't need to depend on anybody. I don't want to depend on anybody. That's sick. All right. Don't be afraid to reach out for friend, to friends for help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you have an elderly relative or neighbor who lives alone, don't be afraid to talk about these issues with them. You know, we're all in this together. And if we can help each other uh, avoid being victims, then, you know, like the old saying goes, uh, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And if we can give you that ounce of prevention, we won't need to spend that pound on your cure. 
Um, I want to thank you guys for letting me into your homes and talking to you about this. I want to close by giving you my contact information and our district attorney's helpline, which is 718-286-6673. Again, 718-286-6673. Don't be afraid to call. Um, if, uh, if somebody doesn't answer right away, we will get back to you and we'll get to speak to a human being. Um, Marlon, is there anything else I need to cover or are we good? I think we are good. Mr. Right. Jurgensen, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that plethora of information. And I just want to reiterate a few things. Uh, like Mr. Jurgensen said, we will be forwarding you guys a copy of this PowerPoint uh, as per Mr. Jurgensen's request. So everyone will have a full-blown copy of the PowerPoint and have an understanding of what the Housing and Worker Protection Bureau does. Uh, also, I just want to mention there is a question and answer tab that is at the bottom of your screen, uh, at the bottom of your screen, my apologies. If you have a question for any of our presenters that have already presented or for our subsequent presenter who will be coming on next, please add that question to the chat. In the final five minutes of this entire program, we will answer all questions that is in the question and answer section. Sorry, not the chat. Uh, we will answer all questions in the question and answer section at the conclusion of the final presentation. So without further ado, I am going to now announce our final presenter. And I'm going to, first and foremost, read off her accolades and let you guys know what she has done in the community. And she will be giving us a full-blown fraud pre presentation. As a prosecutor in the Queens County District Attorney's Office since 2005, senior ADA Ayelet Seller's career has spent, the, has spent the investigations, trial, and appeals divisions at the Queens District Attorney's Office. From the inception of investigations, through court proceedings, to plea or trial to the federal or state post-conviction appeal. An investigation division, CELA's work involves complaints brought by private individuals, for-profit and non-profit companies, foundations, corporations, and government agencies, and the investigation and prosecution of crimes of embezzlement, larceny, schemes to defraud and identity theft. CELA brings to this work background to, so I'm sorry, Sela brings to this work her background in technology and writing. Prior to her legal career, she was a former member of the Writers Guild and, a ma and has a master's degree in interactive technology from NYU. Sela wrote, produced, orig wrote, produced originally broad, nationally broadcast fictional and documentary series for National Public Radio, NBC, The Olympics, CNBC, and ESPN. Lastly, her dad was scammed. She happened to walk in on time. This presentation is personal, and this division is personal to Senior ADA Islet Sela, and I'm going to give her the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll find a presenter, Senior ADA Islet Sela of the Frauds Bureau. Good evening, everybody. This seems to be quite a doomsday presentation. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, I think our, all of our purpose is to um, is to make sure that not only that you hear the information, but you that you spread the word. As much as you can share all the information from each of the panelists with your communities, with your friends and family members, and protect them, it's much easier to do, to harden the target, to prevent the crimes, than to deal with all of the agony that we're faced with every day of people coming in with their heartbreaks. So I would like to go through, as um, as my bio, as was mentioned in my bio, there's a lot of embezzlement, there's a lot of corporate and company things with trusted people, closely held companies. And um, today, tonight though, we're gonna talk more about individual scams and what the latest things are. And we in frauds and actually in a number of the bureaus, we're constantly hearing and dealing with things both that we do investigations and what we hear from NYPD in the community. So some of what I'm gonna show you tonight are really current in the moment. And if I can, let's see, go to slideshow. Can you see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? Uh, no, use the uh, share screen option. Mm -hmm. And then you'll select your PowerPoint. Okay. 
see if this is going slideshow in the beginning. Okay. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. Did you you see the the green share screen button on the Zoom? Click that button, and then you'll be able to share the screen. Is that oh here it is share sorry there you go okay sorry I'm just trying to top left hand corner you can press okay. from beginning okay is that visible now yes we can see you now okay. All right. We're going to talk about the latest scams and frauds. The numbers in 2022, nearly 70,000 victims lost 1.3 billion nationally, which means that, um, you know, people come to us and they're really embarrassed and they feel like they're so stupid. But you can see from these numbers that it's 1.3 billion people who are scammed are not alone. In New York State, $408 million in one year only. Um, one of the things that's interesting in terms of statistics, this is from the FTC, is that depending on age, it's approached differently. So scammers get the information, they have access to the same information that you're sharing um, just by your activities in life and all that data that's out there about you from what your predilections are, what you're shopping, what you're browsing. And those things, as you know, are sold. And so they're sold legally and to people who are scammers. I mean, it's out there and there are ways to access it. Not to mention that even as people talked about uh, going to the credit agencies, the credit agencies themselves have been, some of them have been hacked. And so per people's personal data is stolen in all kinds of ways. But the way that, the way that they approach it is, in, in this case, it's 80 and over. But the way that it's approached is that depending on age, they even are very targeting the method that they approach, whether it's through social, social media, whether it's with a phone call, whether it's with writing. There are many different ways and sometimes multiple ways that people are being approached and certainly with phone calls. Let's start with phone calls. Mm -hmm. If somebody can mute their phone. Yeah. Scammers to pretend to be from business, government, social security, Medicare. They might say that you won a lottery. So but they always have some reason that it sounds that you need you need something in order to obtain whatever it is that they say that you're about to get. So there'll be a fee or that you'll have you know, and there are many cases where they'll say there's a car that you've won or that's coming to you. Well, all you need to do is pay for customs or something like that. They may say that you have some sort of problem, that your, you know, your taxes, there are many different, you know, there are a million creative things that they will say that sound really plausible. And the more that we hear about these things, the speed and the specificity that you'll be approached makes it really difficult to discern because everybody they play on your anxiety. So of course, if you get something that there's a problem with your finances, with right. your bank account, with your credit card, with your government, you're going to want to, with your work stuff, you're going to want to deal with it right away. And they are preying on that. So they'll, they'll have some information. As I've told you, they, they are able to obtain a certain amount of personal data that you think, oh, this must be legit because they have that information. But there's some piece of information that they're fishing for. Yes, they so are. there's many cases that they're seeing, they give some excuse as to why you have, there's a problem with your account. And in order to secure your funds, you need to move it while they're investigating. Or that a member of your family had a medical emergency and you need to provide um, you know, some immediate infusion of cash to help them. It could be a car accident. It could be a computer virus. 
there is one case where it was that we had that it was the woman was told that her virus software had um you know had expired and then they were giving her the money back and then they said oh we gave you too much money back and you have to submit it otherwise you're going to get sued that you owe them money now grandparent scams i'm going to skip over because that was just reviewed but the key to all of these is that they're pressuring you to act immediately. They're gonna to try to make you act immediately and not give you the ability to check out, to think about, to go back and figure out that this isn't plausible. So speed and staying continuous contact with you is going to be their strongest method. They're gonna tell you a very specific way to pay whether they tell you to pay by wire or by cryptocurrency or by payment app or maybe by a gift card. So they're, they're very specific with those modes. And as has been previously said, take into account that there's, whether it's a bank or whether it's the government, they're gonna send you a letter. They're not gonna call, nobody, no government agency is just gonna call you up on the phone and try to fix things with you over the phone. You will get notice, you will get time, you will get an opportunity to deal with it. There's, it's speed is the biggest trigger that you have to watch for. There's nothing immediate that you should be doing in terms of when, when you're being solicited in any way. In terms of the gift cards, the government doesn't ask you to pay by gift card. Any official kind of payment request is not going to be by gift card. Gift cards are for gifts, for gifts only. In some scams, the scammer will deposit a check or give you a check. To, they could give you a check to deposit in the ATM or send a check or deposit money into your account. There's a frequent scam is that they do put money in your account. I mean, it goes to hundreds of thousands of dollars that they then take out, but they know that the amount of time that you will see the money is in the account, but it's pending. You then send the money. And by the time their check is supposed to clear, it's bounced, but you've sent them your good money. They want you to act before you have time to think. They may threaten that you'll be arrested or you'll be sued if you don't pay them right away. They may threaten that you'll be deported unless you pay right away. Don't pay right away. Don't pay anybody right away. Give yourself the time to consult with people to think about what it is. And I think the key thing before we start is hang up. Don't, if you don't know who it is, if it's not somebody that you know, don't allow the um, communication to evolve. There's no, um, it's very hard for, for, you know, generationally, younger people don't re really talk on the phone much. You find that, you know, most of the younger generations are just texting people. So they're approaching them through social media. People who are in, you know, older, it's through or have a lifelong of learning that you're supposed to be polite and give people the opportunity and find out and believe them and trust. And so it's really dangerous because they're giving the opportunity to um, to explore and find dig and find information from you. So try not to be so polite if you don't know who it is. If you didn't solicit it yourself, if, if it's not someone you know or something that you've actually researched, just hang up. You don't need to give them an excuse. You know, people tell me all the things they say to the person, to the, you know, the robocall or whatever it is. You don't need to say anything. Hang up. Romance scams are one of the really complicated, surprisingly complicated things that we see. That they start, you know, with a seemingly innocent friend request 
followed by love bombing and a request for money. Love bombing is an attempt to influence a person by demonstrations of attention and affection. So for example, after a first or second date, a form of love bombing could be saying, I love you, it's too early. When the flattery feels excessive, extreme, happens too soon. For example, language like, I think you're my soulmate, or I finally found what I'm looking for. They're telling you lies to get your money. They're the scammer is telling you lies to get your money. There are numerous cases that we have worked with of who are so convinced that the person who they've sent money to is a five-star general overseas. And you cannot convince people otherwise. And they, they because you can, you know, they can spoof and hack and and create identities or steal other people's or just point to and have the link go to somebody else's identity, they may be seeing somebody who looks like they're in the military, but it's not really them. They, you, they may see someone who's in a foreign country, who's a politician, but it's not really them. They may see someone who's a minister. And often these cases, which are so tragic, are people who are lonely, who are single, who are widowed, who don't have family nearby or have estranged relationships with family members, and they just are looking for friendship. And it evolves because they're being preyed on for that you know, human condition. A scam, some scammers will say they're on a ship or an oil rig. I mean, they have all kinds of creative, exotic reasons why they can't meet you. They may ask for personal, they will ask for personal information or private pictures. But if someone rushes you to start a friendship or a romance, slow down. Never send money to anyone that you have not met in person. Hang up. I'm gonna keep that slide up for a minute. I really want that to register. Just hang up. If you get them, and if you have to hang up a million times, hang up a million times, but just don't talk to them. Don't give information. If you get a message from a friend about a money opportunity or an urgent need for money, call them. Call the number that you know. Okay, this is something that's kind of interesting as far as the way that they do the flat tire scam, which is a, you know, a really prevalent way that they're getting. Again, this is about keeping your eyes and ears open and making sure that you secure yourself. So this is how it works. There's a spotter. So this could be at the ATM. It could be at the bank, you know, somewhere at the bank. But there's a spotter who's sort of somewhere inside the bank or in the vestibule or has, you know, visible to them. Then there's someone in the parking lot. Now, this also works and they're communicating, but you don't you don't know that either of those are spotters. This is actual footage that one of the detectives sent me. So this is like at a gas station. This is the car. You can see the car. You can see the yellow I highlighted, the person in the white pants is, you'll see what happens with them. And the person with it looks like the target bat is over here. So it begins, and this is the car. So they're gonna flag the person. So you can see that the guy in the white pants who you saw over here, here's the spotter, You he was off. The guy in the spotter, so the guy in the white pants approaches, tells the guy in the in the front in the driver's seat that there's a problem, and the spotter has like walked off. The person that you saw with the um, target bag, while he told him that there's a leak in his tire, and so he goes to the back. While he goes to the back, the meaning the driver goes to the back to check the flat tire. The woman with the with the target bag has gone into the front passenger seat and taken the money out. And then 
the what you don't even see the woman because the woman has gone from the passenger seat in the front of the car through this and you see in the bottom frame all the way on the left you can just see a blurry red and white badge this is surveillance footage so we don't get to choose the the definition this is what there is but i just thought it's really interesting to see the crime itself in action and this is with the bank situation sometimes they do do the like they'll puncture the, they'll put a they'll puncture the a tire and then the person drives away from the parking lot in the bank and then they flag them down and we'll have all kinds of excuses but with this video i didn't you know i'm not showing you the video just i took stills from it it is amazing how quickly these actions occur. So again, it's just being really thoughtful and being aware that if someone contacts you at the driver's side, you know, make sure before you go check your tire that you lock your door. Don't get out of the car when they're, you know, because you can see they're, I mean, they're gone in seconds. And they're, and they're, the spotter has shown you, has shown, uh, knows how much money that it's a big withdrawal from the bank. So those are the slow leak cases. The jewelry swaps. This is also, actual, when we get to it, it's gonna be the actual footage of the crime. Again, so fast and so startling of how confident they are and how coordinated they are in doing this. So in jewelry swaps, this is like in at people's homes, right? They'll, you could be on your front stoop. You could be on the sidewalk. You could be walking, crossing the street. You could be gardening. The scammer either approaches you or gets out of their car and approaches you. These cases, um, they rent cars all over the country. I mean, it's San Francisco, the South, the North. I mean, they go all over the country and they have stolen so, so much. And sometimes they'll ask, the scammer may ask for directions to the hospital or for street directions or how to get to church. They may say that in their country, they give others gifts on their birthday. They give presents to others. And I just wanna say before even showing you this, that I asked the detectives, um, what do you want me to tell people? You know, when people are asking for this stuff and they said, tell them, check your phone, like, like everybody else, you know, like, don't give them directions. Don't be nice and do that. They're like, don't take the time with strangers. It's the old stranger danger. So this is actual. So this woman, I, I blot, I whited out her face so that, um, is an actual, this is actual surveillance video in front of this woman's house. She's sitting on her walker, glider, whatever you call it. And the woman comes up to her and starts talking about her mother's birthday, starts trying to give her money. The woman, the, the victim refuses, but she, you can see on the right-hand frame that she's actually putting money in her lap. Like, a, I don't know how much it was. And you can see her hands that she's taking off taking off the bracelet, she, or I don't, I think in this case, she didn't take off the bracelet. She's looking at it. She then, this is the scammer, is actually giving her the necklace, talking to her really fast. I want you to have this. The woman is saying, no, don't do that. You know, I don't want it. Doesn't matter. She unclasps it and clasps it around her neck. While she's, while she's clasping it. So now you see she's got the money in her lap. She's clasping costume jewelry around her neck and takes, oh, I, I don't have the uh, the slide here of, it's so sad because she walks away and in seconds she realizes that she's missing her, her gold necklace, her actual gold necklace and the woman's, you know, is leaving and gone. Like it, and it happens really, really fast. Here she is, like look at her, the victim's hand and she's already got the, the new necklace on and the uh, the purpose taking has the original and there it is and she's gone. 
They do that with rings, with bracelets, with watches. This is a Rolex. I just like the picture. And jewelry, it's always sentimental. And I have to say one of the cases that we had was, you know, first generation college, going to college, the grandfather meant so much to the family, got him a Rolex and they took the Rolex. Like in two seconds, the Rolex was gone. I mean, you know, it was so meaningful. This is a Cartier. Jewelry snatched, moped theft. We see, you know, cases where they just go grab the, you know, run by, grab it off people's necks. Lottery scams. This is where the scammer says they won the ticket, but they need help cashing the ticket. They'll do it generally for people who are not native born language issues in their, you know, in, in that same culture. We'll show a lotto ticket. We'll even dial the phone and call somebody who purports to be the lottery commission to say it is a legitimate w winning ticket and then ask for collateral. So there's some deal that they're saying like, oh, I can't cash it. I'm, you know, you know, I have whatever reason that they can't cash it. So they give you the check. They want, they give you the lotto or the check. They want you to put it in your bank account. You're at the ATM. They try shoving it to you. But then they are like, they want collateral so that you can show them that they can trust you and that you're not going to run off with their money. They that you put the, they ask you to put it in the bag with their money and then they're, you know, wrapping it up. They disappear and then they change the bag and they give you the bag and it's paper and they've taken your money. Okay, this is the uh, parade of horribles. Check washing. Um, at this point in time, the key for the blue mailboxes, for, for mailboxes on the street, people sell them. Some uh, postal workers sell them. Some postal workers don't sell them, but there are those that are out there, there are some people who are going and fabricating duplicates from them. So the actual original key, the skeleton key that goes into those mailboxes that has all of the mail of everybody that people drop in the post office is um, you know, a very high price and they can easily open any mailbox in the vicinity, but ones that are copies only open some of the mailboxes. So they're cheaper, but if they can get all that mail and just open the mail, take whatever checks are there, and sort them and throw out the rest, it, you know, it's a good business opportunity for people. And so they wash the checks, they take the checks, you know, open the envelope, find the checks, even to the extent that we've had cases where they're like, it's a check to the IRS or New York State. And the um, chutzpah that people have of even, you know, to the IRS that they would take the check and wash it, meaning they would change the payee, meaning the what who the check is to, and the amount. So you could have written a check for five hundred dollars, and it's now fifty thousand dollars, and you wrote it to your brother, and it's now going to whatever probably fake name and fraudulent account that they they then deposit it. But your signature is still on it. They don't change the signature, and it's kind of amazing of what banks will accept. It's shocking in terms of the security or lack of security um, in that case. But not only that, you can't really, I mean, it's sad to say, but you have to trust and verify because you can't even trust that every bank employee isn't, you know, or every postal worker or any anything that you can trust 100% that they're not in in some way on it. So how to prevent check scams, try to pay online. Gel pens are harder to wash. So those you can buy at you know, any kind of stationary store, ask for gel pens. And those, the, the ink, you can't change it as easily. Um, as as um, you know, we've all been talking about, you have to monitor your accounts. I you know, would only deposit checks or, or mail period. I only deposit into the mail, the mail slot 
in the post office directly, not even into the blue box that's outside the mailbox. I mean, outside the post office. Never deposit, you know, from what I was describing before, you should never deposit anyone's check and send money back to them, you know, that you don't know, of course. Social media. It costs scammers next to nothing to reach billions of people from anywhere in the world. And I'll just say, I'm not going to go into it tonight, but I will just say that my dad, with his scam, that we did do subpoenas, track it down. It was from, you know, this area. It was the account went to the, the West Coast, but it was really only spoofing to the West Coast. The scam actually originated from an address in Moscow. So we ultimately were able to track the scammer to an address in Moscow, which is kind of amazing. Like, how did they get to, you know, my, my parents? They tailor their approach to what you share on social media. So if they know, I'm sorry, if they know, if they know your dog's name, they can know your passwords, if they can, you know, there, there's just anything that you're sharing, they can use to then give you confidence that they know you. And so be, you know, you just have to be aware of how they're using that. They're hiding in plain sight on social media platforms at that point. And because social media allows them, as I said that, you know, with my dad, it was going to, to Colorado and then from there to Moscow. They can hack into your profile, pretend to be you and con your friends. So when you get photos saying, do you remember this? And giving you a link to click on, it may not be your friend. You know, when you just see a link on there, call your friend. Make sure it really that really is sending you the photograph. If it's a company, do a search, do your due diligence. Trust, but verify. So in terms of the gift cards, one of the things that helps is when you buy, you know, don't do it on an auction site. Make sure you're in a brick and mortar that you know the store, that you know it's reliable, but still inspect the card before you buy. And importantly, keep a record, keep a copy of the gift card and of the store receipt before you use it as a gift card, giving it as a gift to who you intend to give a gift to. Most important of the day is hang up, don't engage with people that you don't know on personal matters. And I'm just gonna zoom through this. Do not call back, uh, limit who can see your posts, stick to stores you know. Um, I'll go through this, charities. You know, they'll rely on speed. You need to slow down, but if you do, if you've already paid a scammer, act quickly to report. So while, while we're asking you to slow down before, act quickly once it happened. Whatever method that you paid, if it was credit card, debit card, wire transfer, tell them it was fraudulent, call that, call that company back, ask them to reverse the transaction and give you your money back. And I think we've talked about resisting the pressure to act immediately and know how they're asking you to pay. But most importantly is tell someone that you trust before you do anything. If you're a victim, these are some of the numbers and sites. And I'm gonna just, this is me. I thank you for your time. And I'm just gonna leave up the, the this slide just so you can take a look at some of the ideas of if you are a victim, what to do. Thank you very much for your time. Ayelet, thank you, thank you, and thank you so much. I'm going to read over a few questions that we have in the chat, and this meeting will officially conclude. We have one individual who asked if uh, we can present at the next community board meeting. Absolutely. At the conclusion of this meeting, I will be emailing everyone that's on the call the contact information of every single individual who is present, so you'll be able to get in contact with us. But in particular, I am the individual that you can reach out to, Marlon Palacios, that can help you set up that presentation at your community board meeting. 
Uh, also, there was a question about the PowerPoints. That is also uh, what will be happening at probably tomorrow morning. Look out for your emails. We will be emailing everyone over a copy of the PowerPoint for the deed for our presentation. Some of the other presentations have a little bit more details that we don't want to specifically send you that PowerPoint. But we can, again, set up presentations at your respective organizations or with your, uh, yeah, with your respective organizations, nonprofits, um, government agencies, anyone who needs the presentation from any of the entities who have recently just spoke to you about elder fraud, I mean, um, elder abuse project, uh, housing and worker protection, and our frauds bureau, I'll be as able to assist anyone uh, who needs a presentation from those respective bureaus. And again, on behalf of our Queens District Attorney, Melinda Katz, we thank everyone for being on the call tonight to receive as much information as possible. I want to thank our presenters, Lori Woods, uh, Bill Jurgensen, and Ayelet Silla for being able to participate and give you guys this plethora of information that you received. And ladies and gentlemen, you have a magnificent night. Thank you, guys. Thank you.